Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Yeah, no opening Star Wars crawl for this one, kind of saving those for the The Star Wars reviews. Besides, there wasn't a crawl for the first issue of this series I reviewed either. Back in 2012, I looked at the first issue of Star Wars 3D, part of a line of 3D comics released by Blackthorn Publishing. It was okay writing-wise. Less good was the 3D itself, either because of age or because they just didn't put it together properly. The story concerned Luke, after the events of A New Hope, seeking out someone to take over his aunt and uncle's moisture farm now that they were dead and finding someone fairly quickly thanks to the Force. It was a very important mission. After all, with them gone, who was gonna sell blue milk to travelers? This episode is also where I caught quite a bit of flack at the time for admitting I wasn't as big into Star Wars and deconstructed a few bits for humorous effect. And then people ignoring that I then said that same deconstruction could be applied to things that I liked and I was really just goofing around a bit. And just for the interest of fairness, especially since over the years I've grown a much deeper appreciation for Star Wars, here is that same over-the-top deconstruction of something that I like. Star Trek, the story of space communists who hand over other people's land to placate assholes and are then shocked to discover the people in those lands didn't like it. But that's okay, because their smug arrogance about always knowing what's right for everybody else really serves them well as they allow genocide or at least death on a massive scale to happen because we don't want to interfere in the natural evolution of a species. And then the future is really confusing because on one hand we have people who really, really like classical music and theater while also holding raves and trying to figure out why their uniforms are never consistent except that none of them have pockets aside for the prequel series that no one likes no not that one the other one for an even more complete evisceration of trek's bad points see my star trek slash green lantern review Remember, my friends, I kid because I love. And it's okay to find fault with the things we like. Just don't assume that all those faults ruin everything about it. Oh yeah, and I guess that episode also saw me fighting Dr. Insano when he tried to take over the world with Neutro, and I teamed up with Jairus for the first time, but I don't think anyone cares about that. What people do care about is Star Wars, so let's dig into Star Wars 3D number 2 and see if wearing these things on my face makes for a much better reading experience. It won't. <laughs> The cover is pretty bleh. Han, Chewie, and Luke all in robes standing around a corner somewhere, and the artwork is... rather amateurish. Says something when the one who looks the best is Luke, but only because we can't see his face. Han looks like he's melting, especially around his left eye, while Chewie looks like he's about to collapse from heat stroke. I guess they got confused when Luke was talking about Jedi robes and just got some really warm plush ones while they were still on Tatooine. Then again, I know someone who once wore a bathrobe for Jedi gear, so... Anyway, Anyway, let's get started. We open on the Millennium Falcon out in the bloodiest area of space. It, oh, no, I'm sorry. That's just outer space with a red tint. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, AAA will still be able to give you roadside assistance. As the fugitive freighter Millennium Falcon slips swiftly through the celestial shadows, I guess Crimson Filter doesn't have quite the same ring to it. I mean, the whole thing looks more like a Star Wars game on Virtual Boy. 
Anyway, Luke is complaining to Han about a recent problem they had. You just barely missed that meteor storm back there, Han. You don't like the way I'm flying, kid? You take the helm. He's bluffing. Every time Luke takes the helm, he changes the radio presets and it pisses Han off. Han is still angry at Luke for the events of the last issue. I wanted to be sure my aunt and uncle's moisture farm was left in good hands. Like it or not, Han, it was a chapter of my life that had to be closed. And I get that, kid, but why did we have to go to Tashi Station to pick up some power converters? I just told you, Han! A chapter of my life had to be closed! Luke mentions that the two volunteered to come along. And, unfortunately, a word balloon that's clearly meant for Luke is attached to Han, mentioning that they could have stayed behind back on Yavin. Editing errors in 3D! They took a roundabout way to get back to Yavin because of the possibility of the Falcon being recognized. After arriving back in the system, they call up the Rebel base, but no one's answering. You're sure you're on the right frequency? I'm not an idiot, Han. You say that, yet you're trying to call them using the microwave. They realize that something must be wrong, 3PO even trying to tell them something, but Han being Han, he just tells them to shut up. However, they soon see what the issue is. I tried to warn you, Captain Solo! Next time, 3PO, make sure we listen to you! Well then, for starters, has anyone noticed that I never got a medal at that ceremony either? R2 has gotten more official accolades than me, and he can't even fly anymore! So, what is it that 3PO was trying to warn them about? Well, probably those five Star Destroyers and an armada of TIE Fighters directly in front of them! For crying out loud, how did none of them notice that? It's not like they're tiny specks in the distance, they're almost on top of them! Hell, given relative sizes, you could probably throw that floating drone Luke trained with in A New Hope at them and hit them right in the windshield! Anyway, as Luke heads to the gunner position and Han prepares to run like hell, the Star Destroyers detect the Falcon. Admiral, sensors have detected a small rebel spacecraft off our port bow. The Sith Lord will be pleased. I must alert him immediately. Dude doesn't want to admit that he forgot Darth Vader's name. And indeed, he goes down to Vader's little pod thing and informs him that they found a rebel ship. And have your tractor beams brought it aboard, Admiral Quist? N not yet, my lord. Then what, pray tell, are you waiting for? I mean, for God's sake, did you come all the way down here instead of using the freaking intercom? You know, this is why the rebellion is beating us. N n nothing Lord Vader. I will order it done immediately. Oh, and be sure to walk all the way down here again to let me know that you did it. I mean, you are being paid by the hour. I'd hate to think you were just padding things out. See that you do, Admiral. You would not want to disappoint me. I mean, for crying out loud, I could have been pooping in here. A squadron of TIE fighters begins to approach, and Han is worried about evading them. Can't take on the whole blame it Imperial fleet single-handed. Then might I suggest fleeing for our lives, sir? We can't outrun them all, 3PO! I mean, you do end up spending an entire movie doing just that. Hell, he even has the same solution as in that movie. Fly directly into a meteor storm and try to lose them there. Han, what are you doing? Have you completely lost your mind? Not completely, buddy boy, but I'm working on it. I can't even remember if I shot Greedo first or not. That's the level of crazy I'm at right now. Just trust me, kid. I'm either going to get us out of this mess or die trying. I appreciate your intentions, Captain Solo, but must you take us with you? Hey, Rust Bucket, this little stunt worked just fine when we tried it during the Kessel Run. Of course, I didn't have half the Imperial fleet on my tail at the time. <sighs> the TIE Fighters, unable to pursue without incurring heavy losses, request a withdrawal back to their ship for fear of being destroyed. Also suspecting that the Falcon has been smashed by now, too. Surprisingly, the Admiral agrees. Permission granted, Captain. You may return to your formation. I'm sure Lord Vader won't have a problem with this. I mean, he has such a long history of wanting to keep his underlings alive despite failure. And sure enough, as the Falcon proceeds on its way, Vader asks if the ship has been secured. We did our best, my lord, but I... I'm afraid the vessel has been destroyed. I... see. Very well, Admiral. That will be all. Lord Vader, I apologize for... for ah, ah. When I said that would be all, Admiral, I meant it. Do you hear me, Admiral Quistus? I... Oh my god, he's choking to death! Does anyone know CPR? The Falcon doubles back and arrives at the Yavin base, which appears deserted. And, yeah, why wouldn't it be? I would have actually thought they'd have given them some rendezvous coordinates and started to leave as soon as the Death Star was destroyed. There was still an entire Imperial fleet out there that could attack. 
And indeed, Han affirms that stance, that they would have left in a hurry and need to do the same. You, uh, wouldn't happen to know just where Rendezvous is, would ya? Don't worry, Han. I've got the coordinates memorized. Then why did you all come back here? They very quickly meet up with the rest of the fleet. Just dock the Falcon, will you, Han? There are people inside I'm anxious to see. And one person in particular, right, kid? Just what is that supposed to mean, Solo? Easy, Luke. Just kidding. I'm just saying, Luke, it's clear that you and the princess have a real future together. I especially love that they're pushing the love triangle despite the fact that this was published long after it was established the two were siblings. Smooth. Welcome to Rendezvous, gentlemen. Did the creative team think Rendezvous was a specific place name? It's like the third time they referred to it like it was a name and not a general location for people meeting up. As Luke and Leia almost look like they're about to make out, she mentions how she was worried about him. Sure, the kids just swell your worshipfulness. Don't even bother asking if the rest of us are still in one piece. In that case, Solo, I won't. That woman gives me one big pain. I feel it right in my chest, like a lightsaber through it or something. After 3PO and R2 bicker for a bit, Leia tells Han that they actually do need his help. With the base on Yavin gone, they need somewhere isolated and out of the way of the Empire for a new base of operations. Since Han's an old smuggler, she figures he might know a few places that'd work. As such, he tosses out the idea of going to Hoth, and we cut to the Falcon and its crew zooming along towards Hoth to scout it out, much to Han's annoyance. 3PO asks if there's anything they should know about Hoth. Not a whole lot, Rust Bucket. Except that you'd better be packing your long underwear. Mine have little cartoon Wookiees on them. You'd better believe Hoth is cold, my friends. Colder than a certain princess's heart. Although not as bad as winter in Minnesota. They all gear up and get ready to head outside on a land speeder they obtained in the first issue. 3PO wonders how he and R2 are going to keep warm. Just turn up your internal rehostat. That should keep your lube loose. And if your lube is not loose enough, consult your doctor. They zoom out, and Luke comments on the frozen tundra. You're right, Han. I've never seen anything so desolate. I've never felt more alone. I could go on and on telling you people who are with me about how alone I am. They're searching for some natural ice caves that might be big enough to house a new rebel base, and they come across some Tauntauns, which, according to the comic, are indigenous to Hoth. Near as I can tell, they're Hoth's only native life form. Which makes it really weird that I see them with massive claw marks on them sometimes, as if from a wampa or something. Also, I guess they eat snow or something, since they're the only life form. Luke decides that if they're gonna survive on Hoth, they're gonna need all the help they can get. As such, he figures a good first step would be to tame the Tauntauns and make use of them. Because, you know, I guess just climbing on top of the speeder and trying to hogtie one is all it takes to tame an animal. This little moment of unbridled stupidity gets Luke dragged across the snow as it charges off. Chewie manages to grab hold of the rope and use his own strength to stop the thing. And we see a montage of Luke walking past Han to go tame it, and proceeding to get repeatedly tossed aside. However, eventually he somehow manages to get on its back and ride it without worry. Let this be a lesson, kids. If you encounter a wild animal, just jump on it until it's tamed. No matter how many of your bones it shatters. Han mentions how bad they smell. Beggars can't be choosers, Han, and these beasts will come in handy later. Just imagine how useful it'd be to crawl inside one and keep warm. And after all that, however long they spend out in the freezing cold trying to tame this thing, they just leave it behind while they resume their search for the ice caves. However, as Han once again remarks about Hoth's use as a smuggling outpost, they are very quickly attacked by a group of said smugglers. Slay the intruders! They must not escape to betray me! Dude, you've got trust issues. It's hard to betray someone you just met. Han tries to smooth talk them, claiming to just be smugglers like them, but their leader, a Mon Calamari named Salmak, recognizes him and the fact that Jabba's put a price on his head. Shooting at the ground in front of the smugglers, they're able to throw up a cloud of snow to blind them temporarily before zipping away in their speeder. They head into a cavern to try to evade the smugglers, who give chase in their own speeders, but it turns out to have been the smugglers' hideout. Luke decides to confront the smugglers with his lightsaber. My father was a Jedi Knight. And no matter how overwhelming the odds, a Jedi never surrenders! That's right, a Jedi never- Ow! I surrender! He has Chewie fly the speeder close to the top of the cave and use the lightsaber to slice at the ceiling, causing it to collapse the cave down onto the smugglers. My father was a Jedi Knight. And he taught me the value of mass murder! 
They just barely escape the cave and banter a little more about the situation. And so our comic ends with them resuming their search for a new base and Luke reassuring Han they'll find what they're looking for. After all, how could we fail? The Force is with us. That's not how the Force works. This comic is fine, if a little pointless. Aside from just the 3D being pretty superfluous and not really that well done throughout the book, it's answering questions about things that happened in between the movies that nobody was wondering about. The action's not terrible, but it's a chase in an asteroid field and fighting with some random smugglers. Also, taming Tauntauns just so you can let them go. Basically, a rehash of Empire Strikes Back and just a pretty by-the-numbers action scene on Hoth. None of it is all that interesting, and while the banter isn't awful, at times it can be a bit grating because it feels like they care more about complaining than they do whatever mission they're on. Overall, it's not the worst Star Wars story out there, but it's not one that ever really needed to be told. Next time... Well, I don't know. I got into a car accident right before a convention, which is why this episode is so late. So, for now, we're just gonna play it by ear. Check out the site if you want a better idea of stuff most likely coming soon. Next issue, Kessel is another name for chaos. I mean, there is that whole droid rebellion thing going on there, so I guess that is pretty chaotic.